these before, um, but just to go through them anyway. Um, Please do use the chat or the Q&A function for any questions that you have throughout the session. Um, if you like somebody else's question, then do just click the little like button so that if we get loads of questions, we can ask the most popular ones at the end of the session. The session's being recorded and you can turn on captions for yourself by clicking on the three dots on the top bar, settings, accessibility, and then show captions in my meeting. So I'm going to hand over first of all um, to Tom Peach and Gem Jennifer Payton from York St. John University for their presentation, Library Assistants Do Teaching and Learning Too, Reflections on Advanced HE Professional Recognition and Re-Educating Our Institution on Who Does Teaching and Learning. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, apologies. It's, it's uh, quite a mouthful title. I figured that out this morning when uh, I was uh, practicing some of these slides. Um, so, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's um, Tom Peach. My pronouns are he, him. And I'm the Academic Services Manager in Library and Learning Services at York St John. Um, and I'm also a, a mentor and an assessor for our internal Advanced HE Professional Recognition Scheme. And I'm joined by uh, Jenny. Jenny, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi there, my name is Jenny Payton, she, her, and I am currently a senior information advisor, so I guess assistant librarian in most people's parlance at York St John University, and I recently got my AFHEA. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, today we're going to be thinking about um, uh, library assistants, so we call them information advisors, um, and specifically learning and teaching CPD. And from our perspective, um, how we've started to think about approaching that by using um, advanced HE professional recognition as the springboard for that. Now, I must say, this work is not new work um, in the sector at all. And I'm really grateful to places like um, the University of Bradford, who've been doing um, some really fantastic work for a number of years um, on this front. So yeah, shout out to Sarah George and Jennifer Rowland um, there, who've um, been doing some really great work in this area. Um, but it is new and disruptive for us. It's a very new way um, of, of um, thinking about how we engage as a department um, with our internal um, professional recognition scheme. I also must say um, what we're presenting today um, isn't the outcomes of a four or five year project. We are towards the end of year one um, of exploring what this looks like for our institution. Um, so, I mean, if ALN will have us back, we might come back in five years and talk about some of the long term um, impacts um, that this has had. So um, we're very much thinking about what our reflections and our experiences at the end of year one. So in order to take you on this journey, um, we're going to give a little bit of a brief overview about what Advanced HE Fellowship is. So for those of you who aren't aware what it is, um, the context of how that works at York St John. Um, and our own information advisor CPD context. So prior to embarking on this, what did that CPD context look like? We're going to think about why did we choose to go down this route? Why did we think there was value in exploring it in this kind of way and going down this route? Um, most importantly, because this is a reflection paper, um, Jenny's going to share with us her reflections on um, doing and going through associate fellowship um, and then round everything off with thinking ahead. So what are our um, next steps? What have we learned from this process? So Advanced um, HE is a professional um, membership um, body and they offer a range of things, including race quality charter, um, including um, Athena Swan as well. Um, and they offer a recognition of practice in teaching and learning. And as of uh, 2021, there's been over 150,000 recognised um, with a level of fellowship. Um, and that's internationally, not just in the UK, so uh, across the globe. Um, and recognition is on the basis of evidence presented uh, meeting the requirements of the UK PSF, which is the UK Professional Standards Framework. And that's um, uh, a really interesting um, framework that explores teaching and learning through various dimensions, um, including teaching, assessing, designing, le designing learning environments, um, pedagogy and research, learning technology, participation inclusion um, and quality. Um, it awards four descriptor levels of associate fellow, uh, fellow, senior fellow and principal fellow, and they each reflect different relationships to teaching and learning. 
Locally at York St John, we have an institutional scheme which is accredited by Avancechi. So some people, you can go directly to Avancechi, but we uh, benefit from an internal um, scheme uh, that our teaching and learning enhancement team run. Our scheme is open to all in theory. Now, what I mean by that is that we benefit from, there is no institutional policy um, that restricts access on the basis of job role. So you don't need to have lecturer in your job title. You don't need to have significant responsibility for teaching in your job contract. Um, it's something that is open to you. I say in theory because we have um, a longer history of it being open um, in theory, but practically um, it sometimes has been oriented with the idea of an academic in mind, which has meant that sometimes it has been more challenging to engage in that. So up in theory with some caveats. We have uh, what we call developmental and experiential pathways. So for colleagues who've um, been in HE teaching or HE supporting learning under two years as a developmental route that has a lot more CPD, a lot more um, um, CPD and teaching learning um, support built into the, the, the framework of that. Um, all there's an experiential pathway, which is for colleagues um, with over um, two years where you just go um, straight to writing your um, application with a mentor. Um, in terms of assessing, um, we have the option of two different assessment routes, a written route and a dialogic route. So our written route is just submitting a written statement um, um, uh, against the UK PSF or a dialogic route um, where you compile a portfolio of evidence. Um, and then following that, you have a dialogue um, with assessors on the basis of that um, on the basis of that portfolio. Um, so that's the context um, of Advanced HE um, Fellowship at, at York St John. Um, Jenny is going to talk us through, prior to exploring this, what did the standard CPD um, for information advisors look like? So Jenny. So as you might imagine as information advisors, we are pretty much your first port of call if you're coming into the university looking for somebody or if you're contacting us online. So historically, our CPD has always been very much customer service based with that give, give an answer, like fix the problem kind of focus, which means historically we've always looked at very practical systems based CPD. How does Moodle work? Do you Microsoft Office online specialist? Um, how, how is Mahara broken this time and can we fix it before the deadline? That kind of thing. Um, we've also always looked very much at the customer service side with CPD, so GDVR, data protection, dealing with angry customers, dealing with distressed students, and those kind of more social ideas. And as we are the only people on site pretty much after five o'clock, those student support kind of elements of how to fix your council tax, what to do if you've been sexually assaulted, and the whole gamut in between. Our CPD has never really focused on how we do the job, more collecting tools to do it with. Pretty much us. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thanks Jenny. Um, so that gives us um, a nice um, springboard then for thinking about why do we then want to um, explore um, this as an add-on um, to that, that kind of CPD menu that, that, that we already had. Um, so as a department, as library learning services, we already had an existing relationship with professional recognition. So um, our um, librarians, digital trainers, so development staff, those um, staff that are within my team um, already um, had that relationship um, um, in place. And to build off and those are our kind of traditional roles of people who would go through that scheme in my role because i'm always thinking about those roles i'm thinking about progression um i'm thinking about um job descriptions routes into the, the profession and again there was a, a really great talk earlier on from fair, fair library jobs um about thinking about job descriptions and, and, and routes in um, it got me thinking about fellowship as a useful stepping stone as a ladder, a hook um, for opening up teaching and learning language through something that was recognised and certified. So thinking about something that was portable, valued between institutions, not just between libraries, but between HE as a sector. Um, but 
as something that ultimately generates access to a pedagogic language, which um, is something that is useful um, and beneficial um, uh, around the institution and between institutions. Um, because um, as someone who is a manager, I'm always thinking about our positioning to wider institutional strategy, to, um, to national policy. So again, thinking about demonstrating um, a recognisable wider commitment to condition B2 um, of the Office for Students um, condition of registration, so resources, support and student engagement, um, and that institutional teaching and learning strategic aims. Um, but then again, circling back to thinking about staff, um, the information advisors do amazing work. I see it all the time. I see their work very clearly as doing teaching and learning work. I see their work as supporting the students learning. Um, and I thought fellowship is a really fantastic way, particularly um, in the dialogic group, um, to get staff in front of academic colleagues, other teaching and learning staff, to really sing the praises about exactly what they're doing, to tell the rest of the university, look at all this great stuff that we're doing, and it's teaching and learning. Um, so all around, it felt to me that this was a really great opportunity to, to, to get those staff involved. And that's where we come to Jenny. Jenny was our first, um, let's say, guinea pig. I haven't got a better word. Um, but Jenny was our, our first guinea pig. Um, we've had another colleague who, um, in fact, we found out yesterday successfully got um, uh, fellowship um, through it um, as well. So we've, we've had two successes this year. Um, and Jenny's going to take us through some reflections um, on that process, going through that process this year. So yeah, when I started, it sort of immediately became obvious that we didn't really fit comfortably into any of the HEA boxes. Um, when I initially looked to do the fellowship, of the associate fellowship, I thought I'm much more comfortable with the written route. But that, that's my go to. But I realised looking at it, there's no way that I could explain my role <laughs> in that many words in a way that would fit with the requirements. So that was one of the first challenges is finding out I was going to have to do the dialogic route and try and say the word pedagogy. It's still not quite getting right. <laughs> um, so looking at that portfolio route, the first challenge became finding the evidence for what we do. Because as, you know, as a desk staff person, everything you do is quite ephemeral. It's really easy to get the quantitative data about what you do and how many people you've helped, but is a challenge. Everyday interactions may leave a real impact on students, but we don't get to see the evidence of it. And even when we interact with students on our CRM, sort of answering queries online, it's where you'll get, uh, oh, hey, that worked, thank you, or I know what's gone wrong from them when you fix something. It's just a, cool, <laughs> if you're lucky. Um, so that was quite challenging to find, um, putting this together. We also don't get the kind of repeat interactions that I feel like the HEA sort of um, structure is looking for. Part of the um, aims of the process is to show how you've developed and how your stu you've caused students to develop, which as a member of the information services team, you just don't get the kind of repeat reactions that often. In fact, if you're doing your job right, sometimes it feels like you're not going to see them again because you've answered their question, you've given them the tools they need and they can manage without you. <laughs> I think one of my best interactions as a customer service person and as a librarian is a student who I've helped before getting halfway to the desk with their laptop and going, no, I've got it, turning around and walking away, <laughs> which is where we really contrast with the more academic side of things. And Thirdly, a huge bugbear was the very focused need for demonstrating subject specific knowledge during the process. My subject specific knowledge is a lot of caffeine and praying at 10 to 10 that I can work out what's wrong with a programme I've never seen before, but a student has a hand in at 9am tomorrow morning. 
uh, it can't be demonstrated in the same way an academic can say, no, I, I know this particular thing and I've written papers on it and I've done this, this and this. I think we often, often call what we do at the desk marpling. It's about 60% social engineering and 40% deduction. So it's much more proving that process of knowing how to know or knowing how to find out, which in any context, especially when you're talking to an academic who's trying to judge you by what are written as academic standards, becomes a real challenge. Thank you, Jack. Still can't get it right. <laughs> um, yeah, without basically setting them a challenge of, all right, show me something that's broken and I'll work out how to fix it for you now. So coming into this process, so those were the things that were really worrying me of how am I going to get this across in this process? Um, I was lucky really when starting it that I had some informal learning knowledge from other sectors. So coming into it, I realised one of the things, the very good things the HEA taught me was I had been applying that knowledge, but I hadn't been doing it consciously. And so it was one of the huge benefits of this process for me is to take that sort of other layer of knowledge and apply it to the work I was doing with students. You can see on my on the uh, side, my stupid sheet card. We realised we were constantly telling students because they're from different countries that use LC instead of Dewey or they've never had to use a library before, how to find books. And actually, that was a teaching and learning structure that we needed to put in place to help them. And seeing it as such, rather than a, I might not be here, please take this postcard and I hope you understand it, was really valuable. Doing this process has really shown us some of the impact we've had on students that we've not. I apologise for the fire alarm, if you can hear it. <laughs> that is the building next door. Um, but yeah, it's so uh, it showed us that even though we don't have exam results or anything else like that to show the impact we're having, we can actually judge it and we can see it and we can start to evidence it. It's also helped me develop the language apart from pedagogy to start having those conversations and replacing things like marpling with inquiry based learning and collaborative teaching models that adults understand. <laughs> and through that to help start meeting academics on their level, not that any academic would ever be slightly patronising to a member of the desk staff in the library, but it's given us that language to interact with them and talk about teaching and learning. And since doing it, in fact, I have been working with academics to put together different ways they can interact with the library. Back to Tom. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so obviously that was a, a, a kind of whistle stop tour of, of Jenny's um, reflections and um, obviously we'll have our contact details on the screen. So if anyone wants to talk through some of the more um, kind of um, detail aspects of actually overcoming um, some of those challenges that, that Jenny talked about, then please, please do um, do reach out because there's, there's, there's tons to say on that. Um, so just to round up, so we've still got some time for questions. Um, our next steps um, are to um, think about addressing um, some of the challenges that, that Jenny's um, experienced through that process. Um, one of those ones is thinking about a library lens on the um, professional standards framework. So lots of other um, sectors um, have started to produce or have produced lenses. So for example, Alden AG have got a really good um, lens. There's one for technicians, there's a range of ones that take the framework and translate it into language that makes sense um, for staff in, in, in those areas um, to make it more friendly, to make it more um, um, accessible, but also for those 
those of us trying to influence and get buy-in either below or above um, it's another way to help um, communicate exactly what is this process for why would want, we want to engage um, I really want to start getting more um, of our information advisors and senior information advisors um, through it. We've got two through now. We've proved that it can work. We've proved that it works in our institution. Um, and we've proved so far that it has some good impacts in terms of building those networks and, and, and starting to change some of those um, kind of perceptions of, 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 of the staff and the service. And if we keep the momentum going with getting more of that stuff through it, um, that's going to help yeah, keep that momentum um, going with, with changing and developing that perspective on, on who that information team um, is. Um, Jenny, I think you're adding some stuff in um, about improving CPD, aren't you? Yes, um, some fool let me be in charge of CPD for the IA team now. So we are adding a lot of things. We've just launched what we're calling our CPD menu, which uh, our staff get an hour of CPT time a week and they can choose anything from that menu or recommend things to go on it that they can concentrate on in their own time. So that includes a lot of things like life be science, marketing for our social media team, a lot of accessibility things. That is mine and Tom's baby in our department. Um, and a lot of teaching and learning resources, especially IT focused teaching and learning resources, because one thing we have realized is we are doing our users a real disservice by just giving them answers in that old customer service model especially on the night shift we've really moved to teaching them to fix their own problems because <laughs> that is the most valuable teaching we can do because if it breaks at 2am good luck and hope you can get it <laughs> fab and yeah and just to um um because we've also then started thinking about um thinking about teaching and learning as part of our customer service excellence award um, and more generally which we didn't really do at the start of this is thinking about how do we determine how much impact this has had um, and obviously that's something that um, Jenny's picked up has been challenging throughout demonstrating the impact um, of the work that we do which is important not just for this um, but more generally um, for, for, for us as a department um, not widely so yeah um that's our whistle stop to have our first year doing associate fellowship um we might not have i don't know if we've got any time for questions um heather i think we, we ran over a little bit yeah i'm might have been a bit too verbose there sorry don't worry i'm sure we have time for um, one or two um, there's a few nice comments in the chat um about people saying it's great to see you getting customer services teams involved um and reframing what you offer as teaching and learning um and i think we had a question in the q a let me just load that up now Yes, question from Delphine saying did you face resistance when starting this process from management either in or outside of the library um well i mean i don't line manage um jenny so jenny can talk about um uh, can touch on whether she found any resistance from uh, her line management um i didn't face any resistance from um my line manager because she was already on board um with it as a, a concept and a process because i presented it um with in, in in terms of look this is how we've already applied it for our librarians for our digital trends for these stuff over here these are the impacts and the benefits that it has um, and i presented it in that language of look we need to be demonstrating against b2 we need to demonstrate against our teaching learning strategy we've got a team here that uh, that we could do with finding ways of demonstrating more clearly how they're linked into some of those institutional strategies that we're being asked to do i think this is a really good way to do that um, and it helped build some of that momentum there um jenny any resistance from from your manager no um, i think at the time i started i was very lucky to actually have the same line manager of you because uh we were in a bit of an interim period in the department so no one was paying much attention to what i did anyway as a line manager i think i've probably become slightly annoyingly persistent about it <laughs> but hey that sounds interesting you should put that on an hea <laughs> so the first one of my team is the one who got their uh, hea fellowship yesterday and i'm trying to encourage several more <laughs> no one's tried to stop me doing that yet so i would say i'm getting much much resistance <laughs> But yeah, my biggest advice I can give to you in terms of getting buy-in from management um, is to think about what are the what are the key things that they're really interested in. 
if they're really interested in the institutional strategy, how does it link in? If they're interested in the conditions of registration, how does it fit into there? If they're interested in staff retention, in CPD, in, uh, in you know people, any of that kind of stuff, um, think about what can you latch it onto? That's my biggest piece of advice. Um, just one more question really quickly before we move on. Um, asking if anyone taking part in this has progressed since IE gained promotion. Great question. It's super, super early because we're only one year in, but that's a it's a, it's one of the things that I will be interested in following about whether it supports and leads that progression as I really want it to. But yeah, we're only sort of one year in, so it hasn't had that impact as of yet. But yeah. Let's come back in five years and I can tell you exactly what's happened. <laughs> Please do. Um, oh, thanks very much both. Um, I think there might have been another question or two in the Q&A, so if you're happy just to sort of potter in and see if you can answer those, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, but thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to pass on now to our second presentation of the slot, um, which is building on systematic reviews, past, present and future. Um, so this is from John Barbrook from Lancaster University, if you're happy to share your screen, John. Hello. Yeah, I will be with you in a second, just having a bit of a technical no thing here. <laughs> Let's see if I'm beginning. There we go. Yeah. There we are. Fantastic. Super. So, hello. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Super duper. Hello. Uh, just come and say hi. Uh, my name's John Barbrook. I'm a faculty librarian from Lancaster University. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, systematic reviews. You might have heard about me talk about systematic reviews in the past. But this is in many ways a little bit of a uh, session where we're winding up the systematic reviews a little bit and about talking about what we've done, what we're doing at the moment and what we're going to be doing into the future. Um, we'll mention we have a new post, hopefully going to be recruited to working with systematic reviews. And we'd like to talk a little bit about um, a kind of a blue sky thinking sort of systematic review uh, presentation. Um, You'll notice there's going to be a lot of buzzwords um, in this presentation. Somebody has already said to me that it does seem a little bit like I've um, managed to uh, get all the buzzwords in because we're going to be talking about systematic reviews. Also, we're going to be touching on decolonizing, which is what we're doing at the moment. And also going to be touching a little bit upon AI, which is obviously what a lot of people have been talking about at the moment. So, What's this presentation going to be? At the beginning, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to call it the argument for more work and how systematic reviews actually connect with different topics. Just going to recap a lot of our systematic review work that we've done here at Lancaster over the past two to three years. What we're working on at the moment, which is uh, literature searching, um, especially around the concept of decolonizing the literature search. And going onwards, we're going to be talking about AI methods what's likely to be a focus in systematic reviews, hopefully um, over the next year. So systematic reviews, what's this argument for more work? Um, well, this is my idea. This is kind of something that's been happening through talking to different uh, researchers who've been coming and talking to us about actually how the connection of systematic reviews have been with different topics. So this is kind of like an argument for more work. And this is an argument that says that systematic reviews aren't actually on their own. They actually connect quite strongly with decolonizing the curriculum, as well as decolonizing literature searching. And more recently, uh, AI has been introduced to this. Um, AI is actually related to both these topics and all of them at the same time. So at Lancaster, we've realize this quite quickly because our faculty librarians, we have led um, a lot on introducing and championing systematic reviews across our organization and also in actively decolonizing literature searching, reading lists and in improving decolonizing across our institution. Um, and of course, all of these combined with the discussions around about the impact of AI are increasing. And again, I hope to show that this presentation 
um, demonstrates that all of these are interconnected and in many ways mutually beneficial to one another. <clears throat> so our first bit of recap, what do we do here at Lancaster and about systematic abuse? What we do is we offer a very good in-person support. We offer one-to-one -one support for systematic abuse with our expert librarians. Uh, we offer online guidance. Um, we provide online evidence-based guidance for systematic reviews and videos and pathways. And these are Creative Commons licensed and linked to from other universities. Uh, we offer the conversation series um, by my colleague, Louise um, Speakman, and it's regular speakers, absolutely fantastic. And it's an award-winning uh, series as well. We also researcher support. Uh, we offer support and advice for researchers. Um, some cases we've been uh, given co-authorship on papers because of our contributions. And even more excitedly, we've got a new role coming in. We've got a new information specialist role. Um, the case has been made by the impact of our systematic review support. And more recently, we've been offering team shadowing. We've been giving the chance for other members of our team to actually contribute to our systematic review uh, provision and learn valuable skills that will help them. So other interesting things, decolonizing. This is what we're doing a lot of at the moment. We're attempting to engage with a lot of the decolonizing uh, uh, subjects, um, but focusing a lot more on systematic reviews. So we've created very similar to the systematic reviews. We've offered guidance now. Uh, these will all be linked at the end of our presentation, so you can actually have a look at these if you would like. So we'll offer an evidence-based decolonized searching living lib guide. We call them living lib guides because they're kind of changed a lot more often. With our lib guides, it tends to be uh, once a year, maybe twice a year, they get edited. But these, they're constantly being updated. We've recently purchased decolonized resources, so we're actually actively purchasing resources, two of which which are Overton.io and Policy Commons. These have been added to our collections, and we've also uh, improved access to certain open access resources. And this will help to surface resources from the Global South. Uh, we do some research contributions. We've been advising on including decolonized resources and methods in search strategies. And one of our recent uh, lecturers here has published a paper which has actually included one of our decolonized search strategies. We try and engage with the departments. We attend decolonizing networks, uh, providing series of conference talks, podcasts and blog posts, as well as workshops. And one of the most difficult things we did was actually trying to embed um, our decolonized work. We created with researchers an elevator pitch. Um, this is a very, very small piece of text that we can share and can help staff and librarians to engage better with decolonizing as a topic, because it can be very large and sometimes controversial. But by creating a small piece of text that we can actually use uh, to talk more confidently about decolonizing, it helped me and hopefully it will help others. A lot of our library teaching now is now decolonized by default, which is we introduce a decolonized methods into the teaching, um, not as an added extra, but as just it gets done. We introduce our Overton.io and other resources um, just because they're fantastic resources, not necessarily because we want to do this decolonizing step. We've also recently contributed to the EPQ guidance for schools, as well as the NHS searching guidance, and we've included decolonized methods into those. And also my colleagues, they're partnering with academics to try and embed decolonizing into teaching. And our decolonizing element actually stems to something we discussed with the departments, which is the role of the librarian. The librarians are now involved as experts in implementing decolonized methods, rather than being an add-on. Uh, we're actually taking the lead in this because we are information professionals. And by decolonizing our methods, we decolonize from the ground up. And finally, what have we been doing about AI? Um, not that much at the moment. Uh, we've been asked a lot of questions about AI, uh, where we can use it, where we cannot use it. And so we're trying to focus a little bit more on what AI is going to impact and certainly around our systematic reviews. Um, in order to make this thing peak librarian, I've included a quote from Nick Poole, um, which is all about uh, AI. But in short, um, 
a lot of the AI kind of conversation at the moment is quite excitable. It's very interested in what it can and cannot do. But looking at it from a systematic review standpoint, we're looking at something which is just a very big database. Um, it's very beneficial, but where can it benefit us? We're not talking about it being an artificial human. We're talking about it being a fantastic tool with access to many, many different resources. And how can this support but not supplant systematic reviews and our process? So this is investigating where AI can actually help us to do our jobs better. One thing that's quite interesting is where can systematic reviews support students with additional needs? And also where it can lead to efficiency savings. Where can it be used to automate or speed up literature resource research without impacting quality? We've also been discussing about possibly contributing to a region-wide AI methods working group um, with uh, Kay Kempers from Leeds Beckett. Um, early days on that, but I can post in her email afterwards. If this is something you're working on, uh, please get in touch with Kay and she'll add you to the mailing list and give you a prod when it's time to start the working group. So those are our three little elements that we're working with here at Lancaster. You know, of course, our systematic view is very mature, very in place. We'll have a rock person coming in to actually lead on that. Decolonizing in progress and AI, we just started thinking about that. But where do these all connect? How do we connect these threads together to make them actually create a coherent whole? And this is where I'm going to attempt to make sense of three different topics. So, interesting thing is systematic reviews, decolonizing, where does this actually play into decolonize into systematic reviews? And this is the major thing we're discussing about systematic reviews and why you need to decolonize them is about internal and external validity. So decolonizing is really important for systematic reviews because we live in a multicultural world, a multicultural UK, and systematic reviews are actually more valid to our diverse groups. They are more usable. And so it's very important to focus that your systematic reviews are essentially decolonized. Also, when we talk about systematic reviews, we talk about creating a fantastic sensitive search, this highly sensitive search. But again, multicultural Britain, or maybe we're doing global topics. If we don't search through great literature, we don't search through open access, resources which are prevalent, um, are permanently used by researchers from the global south, are we actually doing a highly sensitive search? So trying to coin the term truly sensitive searching about this, but people aren't popular, <laughs> another buzzword, but can a highly sensitive search be actually sensitive if it doesn't include these valuable resources? Also impact. Decolonizing by introducing the concept of systematic reviews, you're actually improving your review. If you can actually bring in worldwide topics, make it more valid for a worldwide audience, you're actually improving the impact of your systematic review. Uh, especially if you include key decolonized topics such as religion and ethnic groups, you know, a, a systematic view which would be valid in Birmingham suddenly is valid across the world. And finally, there's a the moral imperative. Uh, a lot of research funding is more available in the global north, and it shows that a lot of research, even about global south topics, are produced by global north researchers. Um, should this be the case, or shouldn't it be the case where the global south researchers and global south topics are researched in the global south and including those researchers? So those are the four kind of major uh, ways that decolonizing can actually contribute and impact upon systematic reviews. But now we've been to a slightly more exciting topic, and this is AI. AI is obviously the brand new thing, but AI-based SR systematic reviews have actually been used for quite a while. There's screening software and AI tools have been available for a while. They are actually a number of additional um, uses now which have come to the fore. Uh, which AI can actually be very, very contributory towards a systematic review. But some of the major ones has always been one of the ones which is going to be really useful. And this is a very blue sky thing, but a lot of people who are talking about is benchmarking. 
One of the issues about systematic reviews is you don't quite know how expensive they're going to be. Is it going to be two or three months? Is it going to be a year? If you want to bid for funding, you want to know how long your systematic review will be. You can't do an AI systematic review. You can't create a systematic review and tell AI to do it and then publish it. That's not permitted. But what you can do is create an AI model that can do a systematic review and tell you how long it's likely to take. And this means you can actually then say, oh, I'm going to need this much money in a funding bid. Or you can actually say, I'm going to need these staff in our research team. Or it can actually benchmark, um, you said you research only English only. Actually, if you do that, you're going to miss these number of papers. So make sure to cost in doing a worldwide search. And it can even say, OK, um, you're going to do this search, but you haven't got access to this database. So you can consider adding the cost of access to that database to your funding bid. That's a really exciting use for systematic reviews and one that isn't going to be doing the systematic review. And it's not going to be taking anyone's job. It's just going to support rather than supplant someone's role. Also, it's really useful is gap reviews. You can produce systematic reviews done by AIs. They can run it constantly, completely independently. And what they can be doing is 24 7 is identifying literature gaps for further research, which is a really valuable thing a normal systematic review would do. And so it can constantly say, actually, this systematic review has been identified. We've created this systematic review. And actually, there's an evidence gap here. You should go and research this. Ten years' time, I can see universities running AI systematic reviews constantly, looking for the opportunities for new research. One thing we're using at, at the moment is producing and guiding us on producing highly sensitive search strategies. Uh, we're using them to recommend key terms, so um, things like um, difficult words like uh, regional areas, really useful. Um, slang terminology, absolutely brilliant. We can actually search much more effectively using ChatGPT. But in the future, there's a case for AI. A AI models can actually be human beings. Librarians can train the AI to be a really good librarian. Of course, you might worry that we'd be out of a job there, but actually there'd be effectively the role of the AI librarian and it would mean we'd see much less terrible search strategies in our jobs. One other use has been priority screening. In our students, screening papers can be really difficult. Um, if you're screening 2,000 or 3,000 papers, it can be difficult, but a lot easier if there's a group. But a lot of systematic reviews done at Lancaster are single person systematic reviews, where the screening has to be done by one person. But priority screening is really useful because you only need to screen a certain number of papers. And then the machine learning model, the AI, takes over. It then just stops when it's irrelevant. A lot of people say this sounds quite radical, but actually it can be done and it can be report, reported since Prism 2020. And finally, additional needs. This is something that a lot of researchers are looking at at the moment, is whether these AI tools can support those students who have disabilities or they have additional needs. Um, taking what could possibly be just a literature review and improving it, uh, adding it, extra elements to it to make it into a systematic review. Lastly, though, and this is where things, I think, get really interesting. Where do systematic reviews, decolonizing, combined with AI, actually combine together? Where does this larger topic um, actually combine itself together to actually be a fantastic whole? One of the first things, and this is the original use case scenario for AI, um, machine translation. Okay, This is where you can automatically translate um, papers. Uh, if you look at the Cochrane Handbook, which is kind of the gold standard for systematic reviews, so removing language databases and English language database, uh, language restrictions and English language databases, it's not a good substitute for searching uh, non-English language journals and databases. There is a bit of an issue because it's difficult to search a database if you don't speak the language. 
But if you're able to rely on machine translation more, it becomes better, then you are able to search through these databases. Of course, the adoption of automatic machine translation of papers, it can be very slow. Some subject areas you can, but some you can't. For instance, health, that would be very, very frowned upon. But in fact, if you actually use a combine it with screening methods, being able to screen through papers with machine translation, and even using screening AI models, for instance, training your screening software with a combination of machine translation, so researchers who don't understand the language can at least get an idea, but then having the screening software trained with Global South researchers, that could be really valuable. Another topic, and this is the role for the librarian, and this is the role for a librarian that's really aware of decolonizing as a topic. And this is about racist AI. It's a strong word, but there is the question is, can AI be racist? If it's only trained on Global North data sets, if it's only looking at resources which have been produced by the Global North, can it possibly be racist? Can it be discriminatory? So librarians, we have to be able to look at that AI, AI systems and say, actually, this is going to enable equality and not embed this inequity, which it could possibly produce. Uh, the concept of racist AI has been for almost a decade in its making, where early AI models, they did seem to be extremely odd and even a little bit racist when they were uh, looked at in the whole. And finally, benchmarking for review teams. Like I mentioned, you can use AI to actually benchmark for your systematic review. And that's something it's going to be really useful for in the future. However, it will be even more useful if you can benchmark for your systematic review, and not only just for screening time, but it can also highlight the numbers of non-English resources and even machine translate them to say, listen, you know, this is our recommendation from the AI model you need to employ a native language expert. And this will create more availability and more chances for researchers from the global south to work with global north resource researchers and remove that bias towards global north researchers in research. So that there was a little bit of, a, I hope, a quick call to arms and maybe a little bit of a an idea about the um, upcoming topics, the upcoming concepts that might be looked at around systematic reviews with both decolonizing and AI. Uh, my argument is I think that uh, both decolonizing literature searching and these emergent AI systems are going to become a successful whole. We definitely shouldn't be looking at these topics as individual work streams. We shouldn't be looking at them as different groups and different persons, for instance, you know, that's the nerdy librarian that they'll look at AI. Well, that's the literature librarian. That person will look at decolonizing. No, it should all be done at the same time because the benefits will be multiplied. These benefits will be sector wide as well. So I something that really needs to be looked at because the universities that really capture us will see a lot of quite radical benefits. Um, decolonizing is the thing I can quite like AI as a concept, but decolonizing is a thing. I think it's got the bigger effect. I think decolonizing will impact upon research quality sector-wide. And as librarians, we're the people who have actually got key roles again. We're the information experts, and we're going to have to evaluate, guide, and implement these developments very, very shrewdly. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Hopefully I've kept you a bit of time. Just to say, I do have, um, if you share it, um, I didn't want to link all the way through the, the uh, conversation um, to reference these because I think nobody's going to click on them. But if you are interested in what I said, it's not actually my kind of decision. I didn't just suddenly have an idea. This has all been conversations I've had with other researchers, people who have talked with us from different institutions, as well as a few links that I've been sent, um, told to read and, and integrate into our guidance. So what we have is we have some light, not so light reading on decolonizing and also a little bit more on generative AI. So if you are interested, have a quick look at those and see if they'll help you influence uh, your guidance. But thank you very much. Thanks so much, John. Um, 
I'll just take maybe one or two questions um, so that everyone gets a chance to have a quick break before the next presentation. Um, so I'll find ones that older people have liked in the chat. Um, so question from Siobhan, um, how often and in what manner is the decolonization by default work reviewed, updated, or is this done in conjunction with the LibGuide? Um, at the moment, not yet, because we've only just sort of uh, started it. Um, it's something we'll definitely discuss. Well, you know, we're going to be constantly updating it. But the LibGuide is one of our living LibGuides. So what happens is it will automatically get updated. Um, it's not the case where we'll keep everything in a large um, discussion and then implement it later. They get always updated. What we'll do is we'll have uh, researchers who will say, oh, I do this, that systematic review one. And we'll be like, well, that sounds great. And we'll add it to it. So it actually becomes an almost like best practice for researchers in this institution. Um, and question from Delphine, uh, which AI tools are you recommending in addition to ChatGPT? OK, uh, we uh, we are only using, well, I'm only using ChatGPT. I'll have to talk to my colleagues about that at the moment. Um, one of the ones which is probably going to end up is Rayan with the screening. They've got an automatic AI screening method actually in Rayan. We use Rayan at the moment for screening and that's very, very popular. But the difficulty of that is in systematic reviews, we've got a very fixed method for doing the deduplication. So um, it would be really good if we can look at that and make sure that whatever AI tools are used within Rayan, for instance, either screening or deduplication, actually are um, kind of effective. So hopefully our new systematic view role will be able to look at this and be able to ensure that the deduplication methods, which are what we'd call per protocol, which if they have to be correct and reportable, can be reportable rather than um, just look great. And last question, um, I think we've got time for from Ian. How reliable are automatic AI systematic reviews? Um, at the moment, I would say anybody brings a system out, it's not going to work. It's not going to be anything similar to a human being um, because we have a lot of knowledge and experience. They will become more uh, valid over time. But the moment you, if you were to produce an automatic AI systematic review, it, you couldn't report it. It wouldn't be acceptable, um, say, by Prisma. Um, but at time, they might become more acceptable. Using AI methods, uh, for instance, if you use a tool to assist yourself with your screening, if you've used a tool for one thing, you could report it in your systematic review, explain why you used it, absolutely fine. In fact, it will improve the quality of your review. But overall, it wouldn't be valid. Thanks so much, John. Really interesting presentation. Um, and thanks as well to our to our early presenters, John and Jennifer. Um, we have got a short break now and then there'll be presentations by our silver sponsors. We buy books and core text in the main room. Um, so that starts in about six minutes time. Um, don't forget as well, we do have our competition running on social media. Um, Delphine's just popped the screen up there um, for everyone to see. We have got some really good prizes, so I definitely think it's worth entering if you're feeling a little bit creative. Um, the competition is, is around creating a haiku, which describes your conference experience. But some of the prizes are really good. So we've got a £25 Amazon voucher from OCLC, Star Wars Lego from We Buy Books, Cupcakes for your library team, so you can go back to the office and everyone's really happy with you, core text, and an Amazon Echo Dot from EBSCO. So do have a little look at that on Twitter, hashtag ALN23, um, and do enter because you'll be in a good chance of winning one of those prizes. Right, thanks very much, everyone. Um, see you all in a few minutes in the main room. <laughs>